The learning outcomes for Chapter 10. Distinguish between the utilitarianism and preservationism and explain how each relates to the agencies involved in natural resource management. Recognize the ecosystem services associated with forests, wranglelands, and wetlands. List the agencies associated with regulatory oversight for public lands and recognize each of their missions. Explain the evolution of the regulation of land development rules when it includes filling wetlands. Describe the Endangered Species Act and efforts to create sustainable fisheries. Extracting, transporting, and refining fossil fuels often conflicts with using public lands. The earliest federal laws regulating public lands were intended to save them for continued exploitation, but now there is more recognition that federal agencies cannot treat these areas as purely economic resources. There are two schools of conservation, utilitarianism and preservation. Utilitarianism states that whatever action produces the greatest utility should be pursued, so nature is viewed as having instrumental value. Preservationists see inherent value in nature thus all efforts should be made to avoid impacting ecosystems, that is keep things in their natural unexplored state. Forests are complex ecosystems, made up of interdependent communities of plants, animals, and microbes. They are one of the nation's largest sources of biodiversity, and are essential for maintaining healthy ecosystems throughout the United States and the world. They are vital because they serve to regulate climate, reduce air pollution, absorb the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide, provide wildlife habitats, prevent erosion, and filter over two-thirds of the country's freshwater supply. Forests also provide humans with recreational opportunities, timber, minerals, food, and raw materials for pharmaceuticals. The primary concern is in cutting down forests in order to use the land for agriculture, the timber industry, and urban development. A major method for forest loss is clear cutting, which cuts down every tree within a contiguous area. This method saves time and money, versus more selective methods, but it is highly destructive and ecologically disruptive. Consumer pressure may help limit the extent of clear-cutting with the formation of the Global Forest Stewardship Council, FSC. This council certifies that wood products are harvested in a sustainable and environmentally friendly manner from the forest to store shelves. Concerned consumers can then purchase FSC-labeled products with the confidence that such products were created by adhering to FSC's forestry management standards. As of December 2011, there were over 149 million acres of forest certified by FSC in the United States. However, this total represents only a portion of our forests. Clear cutting is still a widely used practice. Much of public land is rangeland, because the definition of rangeland is broad and encompasses diverse ecosystems. The wet grasslands of Florida, mountain meadows, and the desert shrubs of the dry west are all examples of wranglelands that span throughout the country. Of the nation's 770 million acres of rangeland, the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, oversees over 158,894,262 acres, whereas the Forest Service manages approximately 104 million acres, about half of which is timbered. Other federal agencies that manage public wranglelands are the EPA, the U.S. Soil Conservation Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, FWS, and the National Park Service. The primary issue with respect to range land is the extent to which such land should be leased to farmers for grazing. Grazing on federal wranglelands costs ranchers a fraction of what it costs to graze on private wranglelands. This cost differential is because ranchers are heavily subsidized by the federal government, costing the U.S. Treasury millions of dollars per year. Many critics argue that the cost to the federal government is too high, considering that only 3% of U.S. beef comes from federal wranglelands. Consequently, there is a question about the extent to which grazing should be viewed as the dominant use of these lands especially when the land is to be managed under a multiple-use concept. No comprehensive statutory scheme for regulation of public lands exists, and management of these lands is fragmented among a number of agencies housed under different departments, which have different directives and land management philosophies. The primary agencies responsible for land management are the Bureau of Land Management, the Fishery and Wildlife Service, FWS, the Forest Service, and the National Park Service. In addition, the Department of Defense is responsible for managing 6 million acres of forest land. The Bureau of Land Management, 
within the Department of the Interior, is responsible for managing approximately 261 million acres of public lands, of which 55 million are forest lands. The mission of the BLM is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of America's public lands for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations. Another Interior Department agency, the Fisheries and Wildlife Service, manages approximately 95 million acres, 16 million of which are national forest lands. The mission of the FWS is to work with others to conserve, protect and enhance fish, wildlife and plants in their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. The Forest Service, in the Agriculture Department, manages 193 million acres of forest land. The mission of the FS is to provide the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people in the long run. Each of these named agencies is managed mainly under the school of utilitarianism, with an emphasis on conservation for the purpose of instrumental value. The National Park Service manages 93 million acres. The mission statement of the National Park Service, the National Park Service preserves unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations illustrates a combination of both the school of preservation and utilitarianism in as much as the purpose of the preservation is to serve the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of people. Wetlands are covered by water for all of or part of the year. Bogs, bottomlands, swamps, marshes, and wet meadows are included. Coastal wetlands are covered with salt water, and inland wetlands are covered by freshwater. Coastal wetlands are among the most productive ecosystems in the world and provide invaluable ecosystem services, such as erosion control, water filtration, wildlife habitat, recreation, and seafood production. These wetlands are mostly lost due to human development, and they are polluted by runoff from growing populations. Inland wetlands are lost to agriculture and domestic or industry development. Estuaries are ecosystems where freshwater mixes with seawater. They serve as transition zones, and include harbors and bays. A number of regulations and federal programs have been implemented to preserve wetlands and coastal areas. Preservation of wetlands is in some ways more difficult than protecting wilderness and forest areas because many of the wetlands are on private property. As a result, the majority of preservation efforts use grants and matching funds to allow local and state governments the opportunity to purchase and protect their wetlands from private landowners. However, many federal regulations do exist to preserve and protect the nation's various wetlands. The main regulatory tool for preserving wetlands is Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, CWA. This provision requires that any landowner seeking to add dredged or filled material to a wetland must receive a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers, ACOE, or risk being subject to both civil and criminal penalties. To obtain such a permit, the landowner must demonstrate that they have 1. taken steps to avoid wetland impacts where practical, 2. minimize potential impacts to wetlands, and 3. provided compensation for any remaining, unavoidable impacts through activities to restore or create wetlands, and that the activity is in the public interest. In many states, the landowner must also comply with state regulations governing wetlands. If the landowner cannot demonstrate that the destruction of any portion of wetland is necessary and that there are not reasonable alternatives, then a permit is not granted. However, on a nationwide scale, fewer than 3% of all permit applications are denied, and if a permit is denied, the applicant may simply redesign his project and reapply. The Clean Water Act regulates navigable waters of the U.S., including intrastate waters by the Army Corps of Engineer definition. In 1986, the Migratory Bird Rule was created, allowing the Army Corps of Engineers to regulate intrastate wetlands if they provided habitat for migratory birds, which were argued to affect interstate commerce through bird watching, thus falling under Section 404 of the CWA. As we learned in the first unit of this course, in a later Supreme Court case, Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County v. United States Army Corporation of Engineers, the Supreme Court ruled that the Migratory Bird Rule protections only applied to wetlands adjacent to navigable waters or to the tributaries of navigable waters, which does not include isolated wetlands. In another case in 2006, Rapanos v. United States, the Supreme Court ruled that waters of the U.S. limits the Army Corps of Engineers' authority to permanent, 
not transient or temporal, bodies of water. The courts are encouraged to look at whether a significant nexus is met on a case-by-case -case basis. If there is significant environmental impact caused by a waterway, then the Army Corps of Engineers may have jurisdiction. The Coastal Wetlands Planning, Protection, and Restoration Act of 1990, CWPPRA uses matching funds to encourage states to preserve and enhance current coastal wetlands and to restore wetlands to a higher standard. Coastal states work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, FWS, to work on coastland management. The Swamp Buster provisions of the 1985 Food Security Act attempted to slow down wetland conversion to agricultural land by leveraging continuation of this behavior against loss of federal farm benefits. It should be noted that some small wetlands are allowed to be drained if they have minimal effects. Generally speaking this legislation is considered effective. The background species extinction rate is what occurs naturally, without human intervention. The current extinction rate is 50 times higher than the background species extinction rate. We are exacerbating species extinction via habitat loss and degradation, invasive species competition, and exploitation. This is a concern because biodiversity leads to many services and improvements that benefit humans. Species that are threatened or endangered by extinction are growing in number. The Endangered Species Act of 1973 ESA, was created in response to concerns over species depletions from untempered growth and development, and because species have value to our country. The goals of the ESA are to ensure habitats for endangered species, conserve populations, and initiate international protection programs. The USFWS and National Marine Fisheries Service NMFS, list those species of animals and plants that are threatened or endangered. Endangered species cannot be taken or harmed. A broad definition of harm was supported by the Supreme Court in 1995. Since then, protections have somewhat weakened. The Candidate Conservation Agreements CCAs, give states and private entities responsibility for protecting species, but those species do not get listed. Permits for incidental takings of species can be obtained, but parties must have Habitat Conservation Plans HCPs, which require owners to make up harms done to endangered species habitats. Landowners in the FWS can also enter into safe harbors, under which they agree to increase listed species population numbers by improving their land, and they can reduce the population and change land improvements if the land remains at least in the same condition. Other areas of debate are the impacts on private property owners, public lands, and federal actions, which are not allowed to threaten the existence of endangered or threatened species. The spotted owl controversy is perhaps the most well-known case involving forest conservation and endangered species. Old-growth forest logging was threatening populations of the northern spotted owl, but cessation of logging led to concerns over jobs in the timber industry. Various suits were filed for improper procedures, but eventually a recovery plan was developed for the spotted owl and its habitat. Improvements may be necessary, but the ESA is an important piece of legislation. Our demand and consumption of fish and other seafood exceeds our current ability to produce it. Increased demand also greatly impacts the environment. Overfishing occurs when fish stocks are depleted, and this impacts all other species in the ecosystem and food chains. Harmful exploitation practices also destroy ecosystems and affect non-target populations of marine life. The International Sustainability Unit ISU, promotes sustainable fisheries by creating protected areas to conserve fishing, reduce by catch, capture of non-target species, and to design total allowable catch limits TAC. Some countries have found that removing certain public subsidies may reduce overfishing. The U.S. Office of Sustainable Fisheries OSF, implements and maintains sustainable fisheries, supports seafood safety, and enforces annual catch limits. Fishery management councils manage fish stocks and oversee regulation. The OSF also encourages international cooperation.